Galaxy 666 by Pel Toro. Session 3. Hello everyone, your faithful guide and companion too here. Happy Sesquicentennial Nevada Day. Sadly, we missed the 50th anniversary of the original UK publication of Galaxy 666 by John Spencer and Company Limited by a year. And 2013 also marked the first e-publication of the book by Orion Publishing via sfgateway.com. Also yesterday, October 30th, was the anniversary of Orson Welles' famous 1938 radio production of War of the Worlds. Well, better late than never. At least I hope that's how you feel by the time this is all over. The first chapter of Galaxy 666 gives us some early glimpses of the rapids that lie ahead. For the sake of providing you, our most highly favored listeners, a good adventure story, some character acting has been done for the readings. This also lets you know who is speaking. However, this is not so easy a task for a reader of the text. As the chapter opens, Pell has chosen rather vague descriptors to refer to his characters, such things as the first, the second, the grandfather, his friend, his companion, and the other old spaceman, a title that he shifts back and forth between the two characters, heightening the confusion. It isn't until halfway through the chapter that Pell seems to realize that he has neglected to provide names for his characters, and then, in the middle of a conversation, in the middle of a question, they are dropped on us without any warning whatsoever. As evidence to this theory, after providing the names Bion and Milka, only once later in this chapter does he use some other descriptor for a speaker of dialogue than their actual names, and that is the pronoun he. Undoubtedly, we will all have our favorite quotes from each session, begging, as it were, to be forever emblazoned upon a cotton t-shirt so as to publicly testify to our personal affiliation with an obsession that others will never really appreciate. For session two, I would place Time and space, they both fly, at the top of the list. The statement, on any level, makes no sense, and that fact heightens the enjoyment of the reading of it all the more. One is given hope that, even in the driest deserts of text, an oasis can spring into view to beg the question, where the devil did that come from? This will possibly put me into conflict with the dozens of fans of this book who would profess that the phrase, by the seven green moons of Gongol, should take its rightful place in the t-shirt. And I would admit at first glance this does contain the highly sought-after level of randomness that we will soon come to associate with Galaxy 666. But Pell does go on to inform us that that's a strong oath for a spaceman to use, which allows for some kind of sense to be applied to it. And it's fortunate that he did. Otherwise, we would have had no idea. The events that take place in Pell's book are obviously occurring in some monumentally distant future. We have, after all, already come across mention of space pensioners, warp, hyperdrive, and even atomic mining equipment. What's more, one can reportedly visit, in the span of a career, every known quarter of the universe, and traders move between galaxies as if they were islands. As the story progresses, we will come to understand just how long ago and far away Earth lies. Nothing can spoil the futuristic feel of a science fiction yarn quicker than bringing in a clearly anachronistic artifact, such as, well actually, a piece of tape somewhere in one of those memory banks would probably fit the bill. But here we refer specifically to a phrase such as, people don't trust their eyes anymore. To use that would be such a dead giveaway that our characters are not as far in the future as they purport to be. Pell covers for this well by instead inserting the phrase, old-fashioned visual perception data, which certainly sounds more futuristic. Pell, however, is never one to do things by halves. He takes the game one step further by abbreviating it down to VP Data. Well done, PT. One can hardly think of anything that screams, hey, look at me, I am a true science fiction novel, more so than the phrase VP Data, even if it is later revealed to be considered as unreliable as introspective psychology. Whatever that means. This may bring up the question of what kind of world did Pell Toro live in? So let us take a small detour back to the early 1960s and provide some hopefully useful reference points. Six years before the initial publication of Galaxy 666, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik and the space race was on. Later in 1961, Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin became the first man to travel in space. The following year, 
IBM introduced the first disk drive as an alternative to the use of magnetic tapes. The 9-pound storage unit could hold up to 2 million characters. However, the idea of a home computer was still almost a decade away, and the United States would use punch cards to get it to the moon in 1969. However, in the year Galaxy 666 was published, SYNCOM 2 became the first geosynchronous satellite. Credit cards were introduced in the United Kingdom, and the Boeing 727 had its first test flight. So much of the world we know now and take for granted, especially in the areas of travel and communication, was completely unknown to Pell and his many contemporary writers of science fiction. They had us driving in flying cars and living in space colonies on Mars or the moons of Jupiter or surviving in the aftermath of a nuclear or environmental holocaust somewhere in the then far-off years of the 21st century. The difficulty with writing about the future is you have to speculate, and humans have demonstrated supreme ineptitude at this task. More often than not, what we guess about the future far more accurately describes our hopes and fears of the present. Next week, our saga continues slowly along with Chapter 2, as we slip deeper into... Galaxy 666 Here ends Session 3 